Good job, Callie. And she found out that she was doing a special the same time I did this morning. And uh, she did good. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for uh, bearing with me. I think that this needs to be uh, muted up here. Kylie, if you could do that for me. You know, a little bit of double feedback. But uh, as we get ready to do our uh, sermon today, I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 5. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 5 for me, and we will get ready for our sermon. Now, whenever you get to John chapter 5, I also want you to do me a favor and go to Acts chapter 24. And put your finger at Acts chapter 24, and then go back to John chapter 5. So, John chapter 5 and Acts chapter 24 is our two verses that we're going to look at this morning. And I appreciate that Kylie gave us that special of nothing but the blood, because we are also going to be looking at a passage in Colossians, where it talks about the blood of Christ, or does it? We're going to be looking today at the difference between Bible translations. Depending depending upon what your Bible translation is, it may not read the same way. Believe it or not, some Bibles have more verses than others. Some Bibles have different words than others. And when it comes to the Word of God, we want to be certain. We want to know what does the Word of God, what does the Bible actually say? And we're going to look at that. Which Bible should we use? Or at the very least, what do we need to be aware of? What, what do we need to keep in mind as we approach the Word of God? And know the differences between what one translation may say compared to another. Now, if you are at John chapter 5, we are going to stand in honor of reading God's Word, and we are going to look at verses 3 and 4. John chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 in your Bibles. John chapter 5, 3 through 4 says this, In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain session into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter 24 and I want you to find verses 6 and 8. Acts chapter 24 verses 6 and 8. Acts chapter 24, verses 6 through 8 says this, Who also hath gone about to profane the temple whom we took, and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us, or came upon us, and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things, whereof we accuse him. Lord, we thank you for this day and this time that we have to study your word. I pray that we would accurately and precisely study it, Lord, knowing that it is the source of truth. But Lord, I pray as we look at this important matter of Bible translations and what actually is your word, what did you say, what did you utter, I pray that we would search it carefully, Lord, that we would strive to stand for the truth of what your word says and what your word is. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. You may be seated this morning. Did anybody have any trouble finding those verses today? I hope that you were all able to find them, but not every Bible contains those verses. If you were feeling a little bit lost or confused as to why you couldn't find it, you may have had a Bible translation that did not include John chapter 5 verse 4, for an angel went down in a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Not every Bible has that verse. Not every Bible says that. Or when we go to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24 verse 8, commanding his accusers to come upon, uh, unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things, whereof we accuse him. Not every single Bible says the same thing or even has the same number of verses. These verses right here are disputed by some as to, as to whether or not they belong in the Bible, whether or not those are actually the Word of God. So some modern translations omit them. They delete them. They cut them out of the Bible. That's a, uh, that's a pretty drastic thing to do, I think, to cut a verse out of the Bible. Which one is the Word of God? Uh, maybe they both are, but one seems to have more words of God than the other does. At the very least, this is a matter we need to consider. 
A lot of people don't even know this uh, to try to find such a verse. And these are not the only ones. I want you to understand. These are just a collection of a few passages that are found in the King James Version and other translations based upon the received text. If you remember a few weeks ago, the received text being the thousands of manuscripts the church has had throughout history. The traditional translations include these verses, but modern translations built upon a critical text Largely influenced by, do you remember the name? The Codex Sinaiticus. These were omitted. These were deleted. These were not found to be valid. They did not think that these were the Word of God. And so many of the omissions, the editing, the deletions, the alterations, the changing of words were due to this critical scholarship. Critical scholarship was the idea of We are going to analyze the manuscripts, all the manuscripts we can find, because we think that the Word of God as we have it is not entirely correct, that it is an error in some ways, that we can find a better version of the Bible if we look enough, if we analyze enough, if we edit it enough. And so through that analytical approach, the critical text as they called it, the critical scholarship, they derived what they believed to be a better Bible. Here are two individuals. Uh, This would be Brooke Westcott and then, uh, what is the other name? Uh, Fenton Hort. Brooke Westcott and Fenton Hort, these were, uh, I know know Brooke Westcott was an English, uh, Anglican. They were critical scholars. They published the very first critical text. Well, one of the very first. There was one before it, but it wasn't much different. These were the ones that published the very first radical new version of the New Testament that became the basis for every modern translation that we have today. And uh, this came out in uh, the year 1881. They titled it the New Testament in the Original Greek. I don't know about you, but if you have the original Greek, that sounds a whole lot better, doesn't it? Than just, well, that's the Greek manuscripts that we had. Well, this, they said, Westcott and Hort, as a matter of fact, their, their New Testament really is just, it's come to be known Westcott and Hort. It's named after them. But they said, we have the New Testament in the original Greek. This is the best one. This is the one that is the true or closest to the true Word of God. And it omitted John chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, Acts chapter 24, verses 6 through 8, a number of others. Not only did it omit some of the verses, but they changed some wording. They deleted a few words. May have added a word or two. There were changes made to the Bible that the church had had for nearly 2,000 years. Now, This critical text, it it was a revision of the Bible, and it became the foundation for your modern translation. So remember, your ESV, your NIV, NASB, NLT, ABCDEFG, whichever version of the Bible you have, if it's not a King James, a New King James, or a few others, you know, the Tyndale Bible. Anybody have a Tyndale? Okay, I didn't know. I kind of looked over here to think maybe one of y'all did. But the Tyndale Bible is a very old uh, English uh, translation of the Bible based upon the original text, but all of your new ones, the ones that you go to the bookstores, you know, if you go to Mardell's or wherever, and all the books that are eye level, right, the ones you can see, they're going to be your NIVs, your NASBs, and all the latest and greatest Bible translations. This is the newest, best one, and the Baptists have their CSB that they like to use, whatever the case may be. And then if you go to the back corner of the store and look down at the very bottom, you may find a King James collecting dust over there because those are old and they're not the best, right? Because we have newer, better Bibles. These are more accurate than what the other ones were. Well, we talked about how we found, supposedly, the world's oldest Bible, very questionable, the Codex Sinaiticus. And we had a few scraps of manuscripts here and there that read a little bit different than the thousands of manuscripts that we have that all say basically the same thing. The only difference maybe being the spelling of a word. Maybe blue is spelt B-L-U instead of B-L-U-E. That's just an example for you. But what they decided was we got to update the Bible. we got to make changes. And so they had them a set of rules, these two men, Westcott and Wartz, 
Once again, people that are so fundamental to the changing of history and the impact of Christianity, and we don't even know their names. And they set out some rules. They had nine major rules, and we're going to look at five of them here. But they had rules they were going to follow to create the most accurate version of the Bible we have to date. Right? The most accurate, supposedly. Here are just some of their rules. Number one, the older readings and manuscripts should be preferred. So if they're older, that means they're better. Okay, that's one of their premises here. The oldest manuscripts. For one, who decides what's oldest exactly? You can get a rough idea. And nowadays with our science technology, we can get a pretty even closer idea. But still, some of that's up to debate. Remember the Codex Sinaiticus, supposedly the world's oldest Bible, and they say everybody says it's the oldest one? We haven't tested how old it is. Everybody just says it's the oldest one. Remember how we talked about where a lot of our manuscripts come from? A lot of our manuscripts come from the, the, the vast, vast majority, comes from the region of the Byzantine Empire, Turkey, where uh, many of the cities that Paul himself actually wrote from. So from the source... And then the others, not near as many, but we have a few in the region of Alexandria in Egypt. Now, the, there's a difference between the regions of the Byzantine Empire and Alexandria. Alexandria is desert. It is uh, Cimarron County, if you will. Kids, you know where your Cimarron County is? My teacher used to make me know all of them. I used to be able to say all 77 of them. Thank you. I was just about to say 77. Um, but Cimarron, you know, it's pretty dry out there. You know, there's, a, there's cow patties from, you know, 20 years ago still out there. Not quite so whenever you get to humid Bryan County, is there? Well, that's the difference between the Alexandrian uh, weather, the climate, compared to the Byzantine. The Byzantine was much more tropical. You're right there by the Mediterranean. Paper doesn't last very long after it gets wet, does it? The Alexandrians, you put something in a desert, it's going to last forever. Well, what did they do? They found a few manuscripts that were pretty old, because guess what? They were in a desert. And so they said these are automatically better than the thousands in the Byzantine region that aren't quite as old, pretty close, honestly. Very, very close. But a little bit newer, maybe, because after a while of being sprayed by the ocean, things tend to deteriorate and fall apart. So they said, doesn't matter. We're throwing all the climate stuff aside. We don't care. We don't care how many agree with each other. If we find one that's older, automatically that's better. So that's one rule. You already seen a problem here. I'm seeing some problems with their logic. Here's another one. Readings are approved or rejected by the reason of the quality and not the number of their supporting witnesses. Okay, so they said it doesn't matter how many witnesses affirm this to be accurate, this particular manuscript or collection of manuscripts. It doesn't matter what history says about the authority of these or the accuracy of these, but what does matter is the quality of a particular one. So if they found one manuscript in Alexandria that looked the way they wanted it to look, they said, oh, that one's better. Who decides what quality is? Quality, for this to be such a scientific endeavor, analytical, critical, there's a lot of bias and subjective things that went on into choosing this. Who decides what's quality? I think a Brahms hamburger is pretty good quality, right? <laughs> Maybe not everybody agrees. We did find a really good burger place in Dallas, though. JG's Old Fashioned Hamburgers. Go there sometime. But they, they decided it does not matter how many witnesses support a particular collection of manuscripts. If we find one that we say is better quality, and which one did they say was better quality? The Codex Sinaiticus, the one that they found in a random monastery, which uh, collections of it was to be thrown in the trash to use to heat the monastery. That's quality. That's a better one because it read the way they wanted it to read. Here's another one. The reading that best conforms to the context of the sentence is preferred. So once again, no matter how many copies we have that all say the same thing that come from the very region where Paul and other apostles wrote from, if we find one that matches the context of the sentence better, that's the better manuscript. Once again, here's a question for you. Who decides what the context of that sentence is? 
Remember we talked about, uh, this was a long time ago, several months ago, there are those that believe that we replaced the nation of Israel, that we are now God's chosen people, that we are now His holy nation. I, I reject that view. The Bible is very clear that God has put, a, you could put, put it this way, Israel's on the simmer right now. It's just staying warm. God's cooking something else with us right now. And once He finishes and the rapture takes place, He'll go back to finishing up what He did with the nation of Israel. And I think that is very clear in Scripture, and I would debate anybody who wants to try to argue otherwise. But what if your context, your preconceived notions are we are the new Israel, and you find a manuscript that somewhat kind of reads a lot more like, yeah, we're God's special chosen people now. God doesn't care about them Jews over there. He cares about us. What are you going to do? Which one are you going to pick? You're going to pick the one that matches the context that you think is correct. Once again, who cares about all the witnesses that confirm this collection of texts are faithful, accurate, trusted, verified? There's another one. The reading that best fits the style and content of the author is preferred. Who decides the style and content of the author? You can get a pretty good idea, but at the end of the day, the author wrote what he wrote. Do you ever say something or write something that's maybe a little bit different than how you normally do? Well, they say that if any time along the way Mark wrote something that didn't sound like Mark should have wrote it, we're going to cut that out and we're going to throw it away. Because Mark shouldn't have said that. Remember at the end of the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 16, when it talks about they shall pick up serpents and drink poison, be just fine? They think that sounds weird. Mark wouldn't have wrote that. So they say that can't be a part of the Bible. Very, very... I'm trying to think of a good word to use. I guess sketchy. Very sketchy means by how they decided what was going to go into the New Testament in the original Greek. And they sold it, and guess what? It sold big. In just a short amount of time, that, it, it, it took over the world. It became the latest, greatest, hottest thing, and they made plenty of money off of it because they all of a sudden had the best Bible through their very careful, very analytical studies. These rules decided by these two men, they omitted verses from the Bible. They allowed words to be changed in the Bible. Their version altered the Greek words, and they heavily relied on which version uh, as their preferred manuscript source. The Codex Sinaiticus, which we don't even know is true or not, Good reason to think that it was a hoax. And the Codex Vaticanus, which is a collection that has some books of the Bible that even they will admit had been written and rewritten over a number of times. Literally, on the parchment, you could tell where somebody had wrote something and then somebody came on top of it and wrote another thing. And they also were using texts from Alexandria where so much mysticism and Gnosticism was going on We'll talk about what that means here in just a minute. But let's just say that the Alexandrians were not very concerned about taking the Bible literally. They were very much about making the Bible more figurative, metaphorical. Now, with that, let's look at some of the verses that are different. And these are only some, please, trust me. We are not looking at all of them. We don't have time to look at all the changes they made. But let's just look at some of the difference between the received text, the Greek text that we have thousands and thousands of manuscripts of that the King James is based off of, and then compare it to the better Bible, so they say, of the critical text, the Westcott and Hort. And then the Westcott and Hort was only revision one. Remember your NIVs? Your NIVs are something like revision number 27 of Westcott and Hort. So this has been going on for a while now. Here is a comparison between uh, the King James Version and John or the NSB Version. The NSB based upon the critical text. The, the seminaries like to say the NASB is the most faithful and accurate translation. To a degree, they're actually telling the truth. What they don't tell you is which Greek text did they translate the NASB from. The NASB is translated from what Westcott and Hort started. The revisions of the Bible, not the received text that the King James is based off of. Let's just read. King James says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, 
the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. The NASB reads, For there are three that testify. I mean, for there are three that testify. Yeah, they left out a whole bunch, didn't they? The reason why they left it out is because some of the oldest and best manuscripts don't have it. And by oldest and best manuscripts, they mean the Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Yes, we know that there were some in the 500s that we dated that did include it, and the Latin Vulgate includes it. Latin Vulgate, a very early tra a Latin translation of the Bible. But we found some other translations, some better manuscripts that don't have it. So we're just going to edit out that and, and cut it out. They say that at the Nicene Council, no one quoted from it. I don't care what council did what. I don't care what the church fathers, quote unquote, wrote or said. I care what the Word of God said. This is in the trusted verified manuscripts, and it's there. It, there are a few places where it's written in a slightly different location. There's a few places where it's written on the side um, because they weren't quite sure where it inserted, but it is in the Greek received text. So, John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. If you were somebody who didn't like the Trinity, which version would you prefer? Many people like the latter. Here's another one for you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. Once again, Kyle, I'm glad, I'm glad you sang nothing but the blood. The King James, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We have redemption in His blood, through His blood. Colossians 1.14 in the NASB and pretty much every other modern translation you have. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. They left out that little part. It's kind of a big deal, I think. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The Alexandrian texts, those handful that were out in the desert where all the mystics with origin and all the Gnostics, the Gnostics had... This idea that everything that was flesh was inherently bad and everything that was spirit was inherently good. And the Christian, quote-unquote, Gnostic said Jesus could not have come in the flesh. He could not have really been man. He had to have been a phantom of some sort. Or maybe he was a man that God kind of possessed for a little while. But everything that's flesh is bad. And so the Gnostics held the view that blood could not have done it. That Jesus' blood, His sacrifice, could not have been what brought us redemption. Because blood is a fleshly thing and blood is bad. So the Gnostics rejected that Jesus was truly God in the flesh. If you're a Gnostic, which version do you prefer? Which one are you taking? You're taking the one that says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The original text says, in or through His blood. The sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice had to be made for us to receive that forgiveness of sins. Here's another one for you. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's see if you can spot the difference here. Can you do it? I'll give you just a moment to read that and see if you can notice what was the little subtle change. Not every change is big. Not all of them are like 1 John where you have a whole three quarters of a verse deleted. Some of them are subtle. And it's those subtle little changes that you got to be looking for to see if you can notice the difference. What subtle change did they make to alter how that verse reads? Anybody found it yet? They changed God to He, and that's exactly correct. The King James reads, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. What does the NASB read? Beyond question, you're exactly right. Great is the mystery of godliness. He. Not, doesn't say God. And they say, well, you can inquire that it's God. Either the Word of God said God in that verse, or it didn't. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Or taken up in glory. Once again, these are influenced by the Codex Sinaiticus, the Codex Vaticanus, the Alexandrian texts 
that do not like to admit that God was manifest in the flesh as a man, Jesus Christ. Which verse would you prefer that would allow you to not have to say that God was manifest in the flesh, that God became man? It doesn't take a lot to change, does it? One little word. God to He. That's a change in the Greek. Next Sunday, assuming I'll be here next Sunday, I think I will be, Next Sunday, we're going to look at how some men have interpreted the Bible incorrectly and just changed the words. This is not an interpretation matter. This is not what they said, well, in the Greek it says God, but we're going to just write He. No, it's a fundamental change in the Greek text from God to He. Here's another one for you. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, King James Version. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see the difference? You may not be able to see it, except for in the NASB they include the bracketed FN. The NASB says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you think that reads the same, doesn't it? It does, unless you read that bracket, and then it says two early manuscripts read, Let us have. What are those two early manuscripts? The Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus. Now what they do is they do a change in the verb. They change the verb. It's the same Greek word, but they changed what that verb is. In the first one, King James Version, that we have, the we, it is an indicative verb. That means it is a fact. Being justified by faith, if you have faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, it is a fact. It is a fact set in stone. You have peace with God. That is all that's required. Faith is how we are justified and have peace with God. What the Codex Sinaiticus did and what Westcott and Hort did was find a couple little manuscripts from some very unreliable sources, and they change the spelling, that Greek word is echo, and they change the spelling to turn it from the indicative verb, which is a fact, to the subjunctive. And the subjunctive is a conditional. It's a possibility. So instead of it reading as, and some translations read it this way, instead of, instead of it reading as, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It reads, therefore, being justified by faith, let us have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You could also read it as, we might have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Either faith brings us peace with God, or it doesn't. There is no let us. It seems to be that, yes, faith is important, but you still might not have peace with God. You're justified by faith, but you need to you know, go ahead and do a little bit extra. You've got to jump through a few hoops or something, or, or maybe faith justifies us. You know, it might. Maybe. Maybe we have peace with God. It's those little, subtle changes. And it is so hard to even find them. You have to scour the internet and go through the, the Greek manuscripts in order to discover them. It is not the major changes they make that make the biggest differences because they admit them. They openly admit, yeah, we omitted that. It's the little words that they will change that make such a big difference. Here's one more for you today. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. King James reads, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, from which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. The NASB reads, And to bring to light... What is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden God who created all things? It reads very similar, but they do not say the same thing. What the uh, Westcott and Hort and others did is they deleted. They deleted a word from the Bible. And that word they deleted was all. Pratas. They cut it out because they found a translation that didn't say it. So where the King James and other traditional translations clearly say, Paul said, I received a mystery revelation that was hid. This is our gospel today. The reason I can stand up before you and tell you that 
We are justified by faith and have peace with God. That is our entire salvation message. That faith brings us peace and reconciliation with the Lord. What they did is they deleted the word all, where Paul said originally, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, because this was a new thing. God was instituting a new dispensation, a new opportunity for man to be united with God. And they deleted the all, and this is how they wrote. And to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery. And to bring to light does not say the same thing as all. It leaves a little bit of room there to say, well, it, it wasn't completely hidden by everybody. Just not everybody really understood it. They didn't really have it all put together. Not everybody did. Some people did, but not everybody did. Deleting that Greek word changes the meaning. Either Paul's revelation was unknown, like he says in Ephesians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 1, Romans chapter 16, a number of other places, or it was simply something that not everybody understood and he was going to help enlighten you, help you understand. It's those little changes that they made and these are far from being the only ones. These are just a few I've shared with you today. So I want you to not be uh, ignorant of this fact. What Bible translation you use can have a major impact and if you are using a Bible that is based off of the King James, you are using a Bible that uses the manuscripts. It's based on the manuscripts that the church has had for thousands of years. That we've affirmed and that we have verified this has been authentic. We trust it. But if you have a modern translation, I want you to realize that you are lacking some of the Word of God and you are lacking even verses that say what the true verse actually stated that there are verses in our Bibles that have been altered and changed and we have not been told. All we have been told is the oldest and best manuscripts. The oldest and best according to whom? I do not care about man's opinion and what they think is best. I care about what the Word of God says. Now the amazing thing about the Word of God, it is so fundamentally true. Even though men have tried to mess with it some, I would imagine that you in here today not all of you were raised up with a King James Bible. Go back a few years and it was that case. But even you using a Bible that has been edited, altered, and changed, you still understood that salvation was by grace through faith. That is how abundantly clear the Word of God was. But I want to be a strong defender of the truth of the Bible. And I want our faith to be solid and completely defensible. And the best way to do it is to use the sword of the Spirit, and the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and it's the true Word of God. I don't use the King James because I like to say the these and the thou's. Well, I do. It's kind of fun. The wither twos, the therefores. And... But what I do is I use the Bible that most accurately translates what the true Word of God says because I want to be able to give you a clear defense of the Word of God. And I want to study the Word of God to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And whenever we use the best version, the most accurate version, we see those distinctions and we don't make the mistake of mixing in the need to be baptized or to partake of the Lord's Supper or to do those things in order to merit favor with God because none of that is what gets me favor with God. It is by faith alone in what Christ has done. So let us defend the true Word of God. If you uh, have a Bible that is a modern translation, make sure you have a King James so you can compare and you can know what they changed and what they did different. And eventually you'll just get used to reading the King James and it'll sound normal to you. And uh, now, with that, it does remind me of a poem before I go. I'm not going to say the whole thing. But there's a poem by Rudyard Kipling called New Lamps for Old. And uh, the first stanza goes like this, and I may butcher it, but it says, When the flush of the newborn sun fell first on Eden's green and gold, a lying spirit sat under the tree and sang new lamps for old. And Adam woke from his mighty sleep, and Eve was at his side. And the twain had faith in the song that they heard and knew not the spirit lied. goes on a little bit further, it says a few more lines, and it says this, And some say now that the Eden tree had never a root on earth, and some say now from an eyeless F that our father Adam had birth. And some say now there was never an ark and never a God to save. 
And some say now that man is a god, and some say man is a slave. For some build altars in the east and west, and some build north and south. And some bow down to the work of the hand, and some to the word of the mouth. But wheresoever a heart may beat, and a hand reach forth to hold, the Spirit cries in the coming year and says, New lamps for old. This idea of needing to update the Word of God, that there's something new out there, something better, that we need to leave behind what we've received and what we've inherited and look for something else is the work of the devil. Let's stand on the Word of God, the received Word, His revelation. Let us stand for truth. If you want to join in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank You for this time. We thank You for this blessing of Your Word that You've given it to us, this guiding light, the uh, true, the original lamp that we look to the light of the path that leads us back to you to reconcile us into you by the work of your son. We thank you that you have done that for us. I pray today that if someone has not received that gift, it is so simple. If they believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died on the cross for their sins and rose again, and that he alone did the work necessary to bring us into reconciliation with you, they are saved and they are sealed and they can look forward to an eternity with you. Let us never stop defending the truth of Scripture. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.